Let's bring this meeting of the Council Rail Committee to order. Uh, Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Fine? Here. Council Member Koo? Here. Council Member Scharf? Here. Chair Walbach? Here. Four present. Thank you. We have uh, one speaker for oral communications, David Chen. Distinguished Rail Committee and staff, I am Dave Shen, representing North Old Palo Alto Group and a member of the CAP. A few points. In support of the residents of South Palo Alto and of our own NOPA petition of 350 signatures, I'd like to re reiterate that we all are, are opposed to any viaduct options due to concerns about noise and its visual impacts, especially to those whose backyards border on the main tracks. In relation to the Palo Alto Avenue crossing, we advocate for more studies of that crossing such that a solution to grade separation can be found. There has not been any discussion surrounding the use of land near the soccer field to the south of Palo Alto Avenue. The available space there could be used to shift the road slightly south, thereby giving room for an underpass that does not endanger either El Palo Alto nor the historical bridge. We advocate for such studies to be included in the work plan. We also advocate for detailed level studies of solutions at the Embarcadero underpass. Our group has had a meeting with residents living near the underpass where we discussed some creative options. By not locking ourselves into thinking current road paths must be followed and adding some exit ramps, we can substantially improve on the underpass, taking traffic away from surrounding neighborhoods and improve access between Alma and El Camino and beyond. Following on the motion made at City Council's June 19th meeting, which perfectly states, study additional options for addressing traffic in an Embarcadero Road underpass area, including actions to minimize redirect traffic onto the residential streets in adjacent neighborhoods and commit to adopting appropriate mitigations to address the impacts, we also advocate that studying these solutions be added to the current work plan, both in design and in further traffic studies to simulate traffic if improvements were added. The study of Embarcadero is critical to us, acknowledging that traffic is a system here in Palo Alto and not just individual grade crossings. Things. Lastly, we want to commend and thank staff for maintaining an incredibly aggressive schedule with many moving parts. We appreciate the collaboration and exchange of ideas in a non-divisive manner as we look towards and desire solutions that do not negatively impact any neighborhood in Palo Alto, but also recognizing that balance must be considered with forces outside our control. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on to our first action item. Uh, first item is review of a common analysis uh, for Charleston Road and East Meadow Avenue alternatives, including hybrid viaduct and trench. Staff, do you want to start us off? Thank you, Chair Walbach. Rob DeGhost with the City Manager's Office. I'd um, like to introduce Eddie McCurry, our Project Manager from AECOM. Been very busy uh, over this last month, so a lot to share with uh, the committee this morning and uh, a full agenda. Um, so with that, I think I'll pass on to Eddie to provide the presentation. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, this is a brief agenda of uh, what I'm going to present today. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over schedule where we are today, uh, kind of review where we, what kind of criteria we're using, and we're going to go over what we've uh, developed so far today. This is a work in progress for the alternatives at Charleston Meadow, the trench, hybrid, and viaduct. Uh, the, uh, you've seen the schedule before, but uh, we are in the month of November. It's been a, an extremely November, uh, a busy month, and I there's another agenda item here later to go over the work plan after I uh, go through these uh, alternative analysis. But here we are at Rail Committee uh, in November. Um, we have a community uh, outreach, uh, excuse me, we have a, a community meeting at the end of November on November 28th, uh, where we'll be presenting these uh, alternatives that are here today along with some other uh, items uh, that we'll go over as we review the work plan. So as a design criteria, what we're looking at as we develop these uh, alternatives is we start with the published design criteria and regulations that are out there today, and we identify design exceptions where these design criteria cannot be met. Uh, some of the uh, high-level ones that we're looking at are the, uh, the profile. Uh, design criteria for Caltrain says, you know, 1%. Uh, we have some alternatives where we can't make that 1% work, and we're looking at 2%. Uh, vertical clearance uh, for trains is 24 and a half feet, uh, and vertical clearance for roadways is 15 and a half feet. And I'll point out design criteria exceptions as I go through the uh, exhibits themselves. But where we possible, we do try and meet a criteria that is published out there as, a, as the basis for comparing alternatives. So this is in your package. Uh, the, uh, this is the uh, 
uh, trench alternative. Uh, the, uh, and I have a 3D animation that hopefully will make this a little clearer, uh, but uh, this is in your package. I just wanted to kind of go, the, the uh, figure on the top is an aerial view that shows the green line uh, is the Alma track uh, alignment. The red is the shoe fly, which is a temporary railroad, uh, which we have to build in order to clear the construction area uh, for uh, building whatever, in this case, it, it is the trench, but it, building uh, the permanent train alignment. And we do this because we have to keep uh, commuter rail service uh, in service uh, during construction. Uh, we can't shut down the commuter rail as we build any uh, any one of these alternatives. And the figure on the on the lower portion is what we call a profile. It's basically showing you in an exaggerated, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, it's a, a, a five to one exaggeration on this as far as that, but it's basically just showing you how the, the railroad act profile, you know, is going to descend into a trench uh, and go be lowered at Oh, is it not showing up on the? No, he's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I can. My mouse isn't working here. Okay. Um, and it goes lowered into a trench, and we stay at 30 feet. This goes back to the vertical clearance of the train having to needing a 24 and a half vertical clearance from the top of rail to a bottom of structure, and we're assuming about a five foot structure depth. Hopefully this is a cross-section, uh, an example cross-section with um Yeah, there's no pointer on this. Uh, this is an example on the left, right-hand side is what we refer to as the temporary shoe fly. Uh, that would be constructed uh, first in order to clear the area in the right uh, to the, excuse me, the left, where we would be building the trench section. Uh, as noted in the narrative that's in your packet, uh, the shoe flight does encroach a couple feet into Alma Street, but encroaches about 20 feet at the intersections of Charleston and Meadow, where during construction you would lose the turning lanes uh, for those intersections uh, because the shoe fly would occupy that space. We have some other issues with the trench. We do have high groundwater. Uh, there's been some groundwater measurement in the area that we found was that with the groundwater about 13 feet below existing grade. So that's something we also would need to account for. And the other item that is when we're building two, these, re, these very tall retaining walls that are about 30 feet deep, one of the uh, structural items that we have to consider is what we call a ground anchor. Uh, and that is a rod that goes back into the soil uh, that will basically structurally strengthen the wall in order to support a 30-foot high wall. Uh, those are some of the items that we have to look at, and those ground anchors will limit our ability to um, do any planting above those ground anchors, and that also may require subsurface acquisitions into the properties uh, ad immediately adjacent the uh, railroad. Uh, right of way. So now I'm going to go into the 3D animation. This is a work in progress. Uh, this is the aerial that we saw earlier. The green line is the existing Caltrain track. The red line we show construction is going very fast. <laughs> is uh, the shoe fly tracks that we build in order to clear the area. We're zooming into the north side of the uh, down by Loma Verde. The first thing we do is we need to remove the vegetation install temporary fence to basically protect the shoe fly, Inshall, install the temporary shoe fly, and that once that is installed, the new the Caltrain would operate on that shoe fly. And then this allows us to be able to construct, in this case, the uh, trench. Uh, we're moving the, the trench construction south. When we get to Meadow Drive, we have to actually close Meadow Drive uh, in order to construct the roadway bridges uh, at Meadow Drive. Once those are constructed, Meadow Drive would then be reopened. And then the trench construction uh, would continue. And then 
Cons consequently, also once Meadow and the order whether Meadow or Charleston goes first is something that can be determined by the contractor. But then you would also close Charleston Road in order to uh, build that bridge. And then the final act of construction would be to do some kind of landscaping. Uh, in that uh, uh, animation, we're showing very low shrubbery because we also have to be, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, ground anchors or the structural system supporting those walls will likely extend beyond the face of the wall, somewhere back in, uh, beyond that. And ground anchors, on a general uh, rule, if the ground, if the wall is about 30 feet tall, the ground acre could extend as much as 30 feet back into the uh, soil. So. We started to list some of the pros and cons and uh, for each of the alternatives uh, for the trench. Uh, the, the, the pro on this one is it really is less, has less visual impact because uh, the, tra the trains are below existing grade between Charleston and Meadow. Uh, some of the cons, uh, we do block the creeks at Adobe and Barrod. Uh, the, we are looking at ways to, if, to look at, you know, how you would, uh, design something, whether it be pumping plants or an inverted siphon, but those are at very high maintenance, very high, uh, there's also a risk of potential flooding uh, with those types of structures. Uh, I mentioned the subsurface right-of-way acquisition for the deep walls. Um, it limits the type of planting, and also you may have to do acquisition into the uh, backyards that are immediately adjacent those, uh, uh, the Caltrain property. Uh, we also require a very high f uh, fence along the trench walls. This is for safety. Uh, safety so it prevents people from throwing things into the Caltrain right of way, but also safety because we have high voltage electrical wires that we have to prevent, you know, people, the safety, for, you know, people from being able to, you know, accidentally or uh, touch those wires. There are long term uh, maintenance costs associated with uh, pumping uh, groundwater, not only in the trench. Uh, where we would, you know, since they we're in, in a fairly high groundwater, we'd have to pump groundwater, but we also may have to uh, pump, uh, we, we'd also have to, excuse me, also pump uh, runoff that would accumulate in the trench during any kind of uh, rain, um, rain event. Um, we, this also requires a design exception. The only way we can make this alternative work is we have to have a 2% grade um, design exception from Caltrain. We tried to look at a 1% and a 1% just does not work because of the constraints of, uh, mainly from the San Antonio station um, on, on one end of, the, uh, of this uh, alternative. Uh, we do have some closures of Meadow and Charleston for construction and we'd have to take a look at how those would impact, you know, uh, vehicle traffic flow as well as pedestrian bicycle. We know those are very heavily traveled routes for the ped bike uh, community in the, with all the schools that are nearby there. And this is true for all the alternatives is there is a crossover and a crossover is what allows trains to switch from one track to another just before San Antonio station that has to be relocated. And we have uh, utilities within the Caltrain corridor uh, that have to be relocated, um, as well as utilities located in Meadow, Meadow and Charleston that would have to be relocated. And that's just an initial list, and, and uh, as we've talked to the CAP earlier, is we were also, you know, asking for input if there's, you know, other ones that, you know, people think of, you know, as pros and cons of all these alternatives that we need to be considering, as these all really play into the construction cost of each one of these alternatives as well. So um, moving on to the hybrid, uh, this, uh, this uh, exhibit is in your packet as well. Uh, just quickly from a, uh, orientate you, the uh, figure on the top is an aerial uh, with the north end on the left hand side. We see at Doby Creek and Barron Creek as the two blue lines crossing the alignment. The green uh, represents the existing track as well as Alma Street, and the red line in the aerial is the Shoe Fire temporary, temporary uh, railroad track. And the figure on the lower, uh, on the bottom half is the profile. Uh, this hybrid is where we will be raising the railroad and lowering the roadways at Charleston and Meadow. Uh, the 
the key for us for lowering the roadway was to minimize right-of-way impact. So we only are lowering the road about five feet here and raising the tracks about uh, 15 feet. Uh, the vertical clearance here requirement for roadways under uh, the railroad is 15 and a half feet. So there's a, that's why, you know, the trench is 30 feet down because the vertical clearance for trains is greater um, than having to raise the tracks because we only need to, you know, have a vertical clearance of 15 and a half feet for the roadway. This is a typical section or example section. Uh, here the shoe fly is shown to the right hand side. Uh, it's similar to the trench. The, the shoe fly is uh, adjacent Alma Street, but at the intersections of Meadow and Charleston, uh, the turning lanes would be lost during construction. So those, that's a consideration to the impact to traffic. The uh, figure on, uh, to the left here is uh, we're showing the uh, embank we're showing the train on uh, embankment for the hybrid um, and things to note here is that you know we would probably be installing some kind of sound wall barrier uh, to mitigate uh, noise issues and the size and, and type of that would still be uh, need to be determined. This is a 3D animation again this is a work in progress. Um, this is the aerial view we saw earlier uh, the green represents the existing tracks. In this case, we would build a shoe fly track first just to uh, clear the construction area for Charleston. This is really to try and minimize the impact to traffic uh, issues on Alma Street. That allows us to build the embankment, construct uh, the um, Charleston road, and then once we've finished Charleston, then we would continue the shoe fly and then do the same process for uh, Meadow Drive. Uh, in this animation, um, we have tried to maintain some type of traffic on Alma and um, Meadow and Charleston, and uh, the animation kind of goes through that process. Uh, because we have to maintain commuter rail, <coughs> let me just stop this for a second. <laughs> um, well, maybe I'll come back and play it again. Uh, we've, we have to maintain the commuter rail traffic is that we build the embankment, we move, uh, we build the bridges for over Meadow and Drive, but we have a limited vertical clearance because we really can't uh, build both um, lowered roadways at the same time. So we will have a, a uh, vertical clearance of 12 feet during construction, and then we come back once we switch the railroad uh, back up to the new embankment, then we come back and we do the lowering of, of Meadow and Charleston after the train is, has moved on. So, looks like I did stop it. Oops. So let me go back and play this. I'm having... All right, I'll just st start it over again, apologize. So first we build the shoe fly just around Charleston Road to limit impacts to uh, the roadway uh, of Alma and Charleston. Once Charleston embankment and bridge, railroad bridge is bit, then we continue the shoe fly so that we can then build the embankment and railroad bridge over Meadow Drive. Then we switch the train traffic from the shoe fly back up to uh, the <clears throat> newly constructed embankment. And then this allows us to come back and build or lower the roadways uh, individually first at Meadow Drive. And conversely, this, you know, the order could be however, you know, the deemed, you know, and then uh, Charleston, but the point is you wouldn't be lowering them at the same time. So this is a 3D animation starting. This is the first shoe fly track. So we're uh, starting just below Meadow Drive. We're building that first shoe fly so we can clear the construction. This allows us to then start constructing the embankment
So the first, you know, as we, we also need to be in constructing some abutments and some um, uh, column supports for the, for the, to take the railroad bridge, construct the embankments, construct the bridge. Uh, here's the 12 foot vertical clearance that's a, it's going to be a temporary situation. Um, the, we've checked buses can clear that vertical clearance, but it is a design exception that we would have to then uh, get from Caltrain on that. Once we've done Meadow, excuse me, uh, Charleston, then we can continue on to Meadow, constructing the abutments in the piers, constructing the embankment, constructing the railroad bridge. And once that railroad bridge is constructed, then you can move the train traffic up to the newly constructed uh, tracks and embankment, remove the shoe fly. Uh, this is showing that we're landscaping, but the, the reality is the landscape would happen at the end of all construction, <laughs> not at this point in time. And then this is where this is showing uh, some staging of how we would lower the road. We would be limiting Alma instead of to four lanes that it is today, it would be two lanes, one lane in each direction. Uh, and same thing for Meadow Drive that allows us to lower the roadways, you know, by halves. Um, and then ultimately, um, this is showing a four-way stop, stop at Alma and uh, Meadow. It likely be a temporary um, inter, uh, signalized intersection during construction. Um, and then the final configuration, which would be restoring it back to its current uh, signalized uh, intersection. And then similarly, moving from Meadow Drive, once that's constructed, then we would do a similar procedure for um, lowering Charleston. instantaneously, <laughs> Charleston had no problems. <laughs> and uh, Charleston and Meadow would have a very, um, if you're familiar with San Carlos and some of the hybrids that are up along the Caltrain corridor, uh, it would have that kind of look of, of a lowered roadway and raised embankment. So some of the pros and cons. Um, with the hybrid, you know, we do not have any issues with the creeks. You know, where the creeks would basically uh, be, remain as they are today. We have uh, very minor right-of-way um, impacts, and actually that should go in the con. Um, we can restore landscaping with trees at the end of comp uh, with at the completion of construction, unlike in the trench where we're going to have limited landscaping. Uh, we can have uh, the shoe fly is shorter in this case than the trench. The trench has probably the longest shoe fly. Um, it has lower long-term maintenance costs. Um, and, a, and this particular uh, alternative that we're looking at does not require permanent design exceptions in the case that we are able to make this work with 1% grades. However, we do have temporary uh, design exceptions for the 12-foot vertical clearance. Uh, the cons are we have really complicated construction staging uh, that can close portions of Alma and Charleston. Um, and we'd have the limited uh, vertical clearance. Uh, we have the same issue of relocating the railroad uh, crossover. Uh, and we still have major re re excuse me, utility relocations uh, because of the utilities, in this case in Alma, uh, Meadow, and Charleston. However, the utilities that are within the Caltrain corridor would likely not be impacted because we're just building embankment on top of it. So finally, the last alternative uh, that I will go through is what we call the viaduct, <laughs> which is a the railroad is raised on structure, uh, just like in the exhibits uh, previously, and this is in your packet. The upper uh, figure is an aerial structure with the north to the left, the creeks uh, uh, um, shown in blue uh, crossing the uh, alignment. Uh, the red is the shoe fly, and the green is uh, representing the existing tracks and, and adjacent to Alma. The figure on the lower portion is the profile, where we take the viaduct up and over the roadways. Uh, we are 
here at a 15 and a half foot uh, vertical clearance over the roadways with an assumed structure depth of about five feet. So our total uh, raised uh, uh, railroad is about 20, 21 feet maximum. This is a sample cross section showing a viaduct uh, in the similar location as uh, we showed for the trench and the um, uh, hybrid with the uh, viaduct structure uh, shown on the left-hand side with uh, sound wall barriers uh, that would probably be constructed on this to attenuate noise. And then we'd have the temporary fences protecting the shoe fly on, on the bottom. Um, I'll come back to this, but as we look at the 3D viaduct, we also have checked uh, where looking at putting the permanent track in the location of the shoe fly, thereby being able to eliminate uh, the shoe fly. And we've run the numbers. Uh, the difference here is the shoe fly is designed for a 75 mile per hour uh, design speed, and a permanent track needs to be designed for 110 miles per hour. And uh, that uh, evaluation is looking very promising in the fact that we could basically move the viaduct structure to where the shoe fly is and then um, and have that as a, another option but we're working on that option and developing the exhibits for that so I don't have any exhibits for that today so um, this is the 3d animation we've seen this aerial here with the uh, the shoe fly is being built um, First, to clear the construction area, uh, the viaduct is constructed, depicted in purple, and we start again at the north end around Loma Verde. We remove the vegetation first, install the temporary uh, protective fencing. Then we can install the shoe fly. And once we've moved the Caltrain operations to the shoe fly, then we can start the construction of a viaduct where for the first portion of the viaduct, about the first 600 feet, it's on embankment until we get enough height and then it moves to structure and stays on structure uh, over meadow and continues at, at a raised viaduct over meadow to Charleston and once it gets to Charleston, then it goes back down on embankment. And at the completion, uh, you can come back and landscape uh, the areas in and around the viaduct. Uh, if you could imagine where that shoe fly alignment was, would be where uh, a permanent viaduct is, and we're developing that alternative here. So the pros, um, this one has probably the least impact to roadways during construction. Um, as I mentioned, we have the option to build this without a shoe fly. Uh, landscaping can be restored. Uh, there's an opportunity for a park if we, you know, a linear park. Um, and it does not block creeks, uh, just in the hybrid uh, version as well. It probably has the lowest uh, long-term maintenance cost. And we really avoid major utility relocations in the roadways as well as in uh, the Caltrain corridor. The cons are, you know, it does have the, probably the highest visual impact. It's, this one does require a design exception. Uh, the portion of the grade going from uh, uh, coming back down at the, at the southern end of the uh, uh, profile is at a 1.4%. So that would require a design exception from Caltrain. And it also requires the railroad crossover just north of Antonio, as did all the alternatives. So as we look through these uh, alternatives, uh, we will be developing an um, evaluation matrix, which is based on the criteria that was adopted by city council back in 2017. Um, we've taken this criteria here, and we've started the process of putting it into an evaluation matrix. Uh, we presented this evaluation to the CAP, and we're asking for feedback on this um, as well, you know, or ideas, uh, where each one of the, uh, on the upper, uh, uh, upper line there, we have the three alternatives, and then the criteria is on the left-hand side, kind of moving down and, and looking at each one of these, how these alternatives play 
uh, relative to each other, not necessarily, you know, to to other things, just trying to narrow down these alternatives as there are pros and cons and how, you know, which one is, is ultimately going to, you know, surface to the top as a preferred alternative. We are working on the order of magnitude of cost, uh, and we will have those costs by the time the community meeting comes around on November tw uh, 28th, uh, but we're in the process of doing some review of those, making sure that we have captured um, the cost uh, ac um, um, adequately because there are a lot of cost issues associated with each one of these uh, alternatives. And with that, I, that's the um, questions or comments. You know, actually, before we go to that, if I might ask for one clarification, Etty, um, you made several references to right-of-way and impacts on right-of-way. Could you clarify that since, you know, it's often not um, understood that what you mean by that is property acquisition? You uh, did make reference in the case of tr trench to the um, subsurface uh, easements needed, but in terms of actual property changes needed, would you do a quick recap of that? Oh, so for these alternatives, um, as I, I may, uh, to kind of recap, is when we started looking at these alternatives, when we were looking at the roadway, we tried to limit the number of impacts to private property. Um, and so as we look at these, and I, hopefully I'm addressing this. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we looked at those, and so the hybrid does, you know, as we lower the roadway, we do touch a couple driveways, so those are some property acquisition or some type of uh, negotiation to make those driveway modifications. In the trench, there is a right-of-way impact potential for subsurface because of the ground anchors, and in the viaduct, there is no uh, uh, property or right-of-way uh, necessary uh, as, as we see it today for that alternative. Uh, the other items that we also need to consider when we look at the trench as well as the hybrid is e, uh, locations for pumping plants um, as well as locations for those drainage facilities that may also require right-of-way, but we need to take a look at if we can fit those into areas that would not um, have private property impacts. And that's kind of as we've moved these alternatives forward is we're trying to look at those, uh, these alternatives to reduce private property impacts. Uh, there is some, I guess, negotiation between the Caltrain right-of-way and what city right-of-way right as well, so we should probably bring that into the fold as well, but that happens for all three alternatives in this case. Thank so. you. I, I did just want to highlight that, recognizing the um, previous discussion and concerns regarding private property acquisition and that none of these uh, alternatives really require substantial or much less any whole uh, property acquisitions, pri private property acquisitions, to your point. Thank you. So let's do just real quick clarifying questions uh, from committee members, and then we have several public speakers who will have three minutes each. And as it has been our practice for this committee uh, uh, this year, uh, people will have an opportunity to speak again uh, if you need to. No requirement to speak again, but you will have an opportunity to speak again, um, or if you did not speak during this first round, towards the end of our discussion on each action item. Um, I have a, a quick clarifying question. You said that by the time we go to the community meeting at the end of the month, we'll have cost estimates. Cost estimates will depend significantly on responses from Caltrain uh, to our recent letter, and we're expecting that will take quite some time, uh, per perhaps months even. And so when you bring us cost estimates, will you bring us if A, cost X, if B, cost Y, et cetera, depending on the contingencies, such as um, variances on uh, steepness of grade and clearance, because that'll, again, have a real significant impact on cost. So we will be costing this based on the alternatives we have, and we can do, we will have, we can have contingencies in there for like, you know, if X or if Y. Um, right now, for instance, the uh, trench, we can only make the trench work with a 2%, so we are gonna assume that at this point in time, somewhere down the line, a 2% would be um, achievable. Um, so as we move forward with the cost estimate, we're making that assumption. And uh, what if the, will you also include a you know, uh, alternative for the cost if we're able to get an exemption on the height of the clearance required for the trench? Um, 
a permanent? You, you mean, it, oh, if you if we if were, we're able, able to reduce the height clearance requirement from 25 feet to about 18 feet as we've requested? Um, we um, we can take a look at that. We've we've run some an initial engineering analysis on that, and it doesn't reduce the length very much. So I'm not. We we could take a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just I think it'll be helpful to have a sense of whether that would significantly impact the cost, as uh, a lot of people have suggested. Uh, any other clarifying questions? Well, perhaps just, oh. just to be clear yeah. on what Eddie's response was, um, I think as, you, as she described, it's not expected to significantly reduce the length of the work needed. And so there would be an incremental savings. I do have to question whether uh, preparing a separate cost estimate for that alternative is valuable at this point. I think we're going to be looking at lots of different incremental changes and variations on the themes along the way. So while I'm sure the AECOM team is capable of coming up with another estimate, we haven't directed them to do that as a, at this point. Well, we might want to at least include an asterisk. <laughs> Right. And recognize, uh, again, right. to your point, there could be a number of reasons that there could be savings, but we do want to present an order of magnitude for comparison uh, purposes, uh, cost estimate among the different right. alternatives. Yeah, if it's if it's the professional understanding of recommendation of, of uh, the staff, the consultants, that the cost savings from achieving that high clearance exemption would be incremental rather than substantial, you know, Mention that as well, but just it's it's just something important to address. I think at, at minimum. Uh, any other clarifying questions, and then we'll have several public speakers. Yep. Adrian, thank you very much. Um, that was very helpful. Um, three quick questions. One, just to be absolutely clear, the shoe flies will be at grade, right? In all cases. That is correct. Okay. Um, and then did I hear you correctly that a 2% grade exception is only needed in the southern portion from San Antonio to Charleston? For the trench? For the trench. No, it's on both. Uh, it it's also from East Meadow to Cal me, before, It's in the exhibit, but let me, let me look at that before I... <laughs> No, it's on uh, both. It's the on both sides? Okay, both sorry. sides, correct. I thought I heard you say it was just on the uh, San Antonio side. Um, and then you mentioned that all of these designs are using 110 miles per hour as the design speed uh, requirement. Um, is that the assumption we're using across all of our scenarios, including the tunnel? Correct. Okay. That is the, desi that is the design speed that's required and it's listed in the Caltrain design criteria. Okay. So to, to your question uh, there is like we're trying to keep criteria similar, so we're kind of comparing apples and apples as we look at these alternatives. Okay, fair, thank you. Greg? Yeah, maybe I missed it, but um, in the difference between the viaduct and the um, hybrid, what's the difference in the height? I was, I mean, do we have a height number for each? Yes. Uh, the viaduct, the top of rail, um, and I'll just, you know, for that reference, the top of rail for the viaduct is about 21 feet above the road surface, and the uh, hybrid is about 15 feet above the road surface, so about six foot difference. Okay. Ex excluding fences and barriers, it's just uh, for comparison. So <coughs> I guess the question is, is how do we judge, I mean, 15 feet is still pretty, is a pretty, pretty, pretty big high barrier, frankly. I, I'm, and I'm trying to figure out how we're going to judge what the real visual impact is on that. And is there, are there noise? Is it louder or is that not a, not a factor? I mean, I'm just trying to hone in on the differences between the two. Because it seems like the viaduct, when you do this, has you know, a lot less traffic impacts than that as we build it. And there's a bunch of stuff. So I guess the question is, is it, you know, how, how are we going to, what are we going to use to figure those issues out? So at the CAPS uh, suggestion, we have been asked to create visuals of uh, views looking from the viaduct down and looking from, you know, backyards up. And so we're taking a, if we can do that once we've done these 3D animations, we can then create those views. So that's what they're in the process of doing so that hopefully that gives people an, ab an ability to visualize what that would look like. Okay. Any other questions? No. Lydia? 
Thank you. Um, so Caltrain right now on the existing track is installing this shoe fly, correct? For their, I mean, or their electrical poles currently on the existing. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. So Caltrain, they're installing their poles for the electrification along the existing rail. So I was just wondering for your viaduct um, option and even perhaps the trench, instead of doing the shoe fly, why can't we leave Caltrain where it is right now and then start the um, viaduct uh, construction or even the trench in the center and then have both sides relieve I mean, at least have less impact visually as well as noise for the houses on both sides. So we did, uh, um, our, my engineer did take a look at, you're talking for the trench option, correct? Trench or viaduct, you know so, what I mean? Because the viaduct at this point, the one that you showed, is really close to the west side. Right. Um, and then you have that open space in the center with vegetation and so forth in the future. Instead of having the viaduct right next to the homes, why not put it in the center and have, you know, more other uses on the two sides where houses abut the the um, the road? Uh, we are actually looking at that right now, and at, and so the difference it does work for the viaduct, and only we're the viaduct, huh? Only the viaduct. Only the viaduct. Uh, the difference here that we have to consider is the shoe fly is designed for a 75 mile per hour design speed. So that, you know, and but a permanent alignment, which is what you were talking about, is designed for 110 mile per hour design speed. So it takes longer to, for the vertical curves, takes longer to, you know, so it affects the geometry. For the viaduct, it looks like we can make it work. For, I mean, excuse me, yes, yeah, for the viaduct. For the trench, we did look at it and it does not work um, because of the geometry that we have and the constraints that we have. So. Um, but you will consider putting together another option for the viaduct to show in the center versus towards the west side, close to the houses. It, it's it, not in this, here, let me go back to that uh, slide here. Um. <clears throat> so the um, what we're looking at is not in the center, so where the shoe fly is shown here would be where the viaduct could be located, and that would free up. The, where the viaduct is located, basically you'd flop this, but you wouldn't have a shoe fly at all. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so AECOM is looking at that variation. Would and that be able to be presented at the 28th so that the community also has that option to review? I mean, if we're going to go out to a community. Yes. Um, okay. We're in the process of, of, of doing that now. So I have a little bit of a, uh, terminology help me with that. When you say top of rail, you're not adding on the train itself on the viaduct. So when you say, for the example, the hybrid is at 15 feet um, from the street, from ground, goes up 15 feet, then you have to add the train, height of the train. So please do that into your um, presentation because that's important when they're going by. Then also with the other one, um, the 21 feet, I think that's a viaduct, right? Uh, the 21 feet is the viaduct, yes. Right, so the that's from the street the hybrid. to the viaduct rail itself. Right, so I'm getting the mouse working. So when I, say top of tra when I say top of rail, that's really the bottom of the train. The yeah, wheels. Okay, but so. The wheels, yeah. When you add the train, and in this picture, it's really great because you see the viaduct. It's going to be 21 feet up in the air. Then you add on the train itself. That's another height. And then you have the poles. And these poles are tall. I mean, very tall. So um, it would be good to have 
the f how f how tall they are, how you know the feet, including the train. What's the height of the train? What is the height of the pole? Then your sound wall barrier, same thing. I mean, include all of the heights in there so people know. Um, yeah, so that would be one that I would like to clarify on. Um, then also um, with your, um, what are those called? You know, the um, right of way, the the anchors? Anchors, yes, thank you. Um, you know, I was watching the video from the CAP meeting, and Tony Carrasco mentioned that there was the, um, in oh, the, the uh, presentation that right. um, the other gentleman from, yes. who had their rail put in the trench, they had the um, concrete beams across the top to do the same uh, function of keeping the walls intact in place. Why are we not going with that and why are we intruding into private property right of ways? Um, I think that's another option that we should be looking at. We, we, are, we are looking at that. Um, we, this, uh, these are, those are called whalers or struts. Uh, whalers? Whalers or struts. Those would be a beam that would um, but he was talking about you'd put a beam right here at the top right here and that would uh, be, allow you uh, we are um, taking a look at that the portion where those struts and whalers would not work is where you start are you starting to descend uh, into your full trench because those would be in the way of the train operations but you could look at struts and whalers in the portions between charleston and meadow um, but uh, our initial evaluation is that that could reduce the number of ground anchors, but it would not necessarily eliminate the number of ground acres. But uh, we're taking a look at the geo, because ground acre design is a function of geotechnical engineering and what the soil is behind it, you know, where the groundwater is, um, and then the, you know, the height and the loading that's coming into the walls. So we'll take a look at that and see if it's, if it's, uh, if it's, it can, eliminate but our, our my initial reaction is it may reduce but it may it would not eliminate ground anchors um, I understand ground anch anchors if it goes into a private property is that would mean that perhaps they won't have they have the ability to have swimming pools they can't plant trees it would be um, a, an that's an invasion right to it would be an encumbered right-of-way that it, would would have limitations on it to what people could do over that right of way. Right, and I don't think the water table over there is as high. I'm not quite sure, but you know that's something that's going to be uh, eliminated for many people. Um, so, as much options as you can put out there, would uh, so that at this November 28th meeting is something that is important for everybody to kind of. Uh, understand what they're going to be getting. Um, then one more thing is, why are we not looking? So you're presenting all of these options at the next meeting, but then the tunnel is not in there. How soon do you, I mean, I hope that that is gonna be something that's brought up to everybody at the community meeting that this option is still to come and it's not something that we're not addressing, correct? Uh, correct. Uh, we're gonna go over the work plan here uh, next. Okay. Uh, and the next community meeting, which is in January, is going to touch on the tunnel within city limits as well as the Palo Alto and Churchill uh, alternatives that are still on the table. Okay, last question. Um, um, so I understand that, you know, with the water, with the creeks and so forth, there's supposed to be a letter from the Santa Clara Valley Water District. I don't see it at places. Um, any any time that we'll get it soon? Now? Um, we do have the letter from the water district. We did meet with them or the team met with them on October 12th and we asked them to put in writing the responses to the questions we had and we have an at places memo for you the do? committee and for the public at the back uh, for the, um, and it includes three letters in fact. It's the letter that, um, <coughs> that we sent to Caltrain on uh, exceptions that we're in criteria that we'd like to see exceptions in for our alternative analysis plus the letter from uh, the Water District uh, on their response to the alternatives that are being evaluated. 
And then there's also a letter from 2017 uh, that was requested, uh, that was sent to the JPB. So. Oh, I didn't see this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so we're going to go to public speakers on this one. Um, uh, we do have quite a few public speakers. I already said that you'd have three minutes each. If you can make your comments in one or two minutes, please do. Uh, but you will have a three minute limit. Uh, and um, again, you do not need to speak a second time or use all of your time. Uh, I just want to make sure we can get through this, uh, this content efficiently. So our first speaker, our first speaker is uh, David uh, Herzl, to be followed by um, uh, Bonnie. And just uh, uh, apologies for the noise. There's uh, some work going on testing an alarm system. So uh, please forgive the annoying beeping sound. Go. OK, go ahead. Uh, thank you, council members, for uh, listening to me. Uh, I've lived in Palo Alto for uh, over uh, 50 years. Um, I believe that uh, Palo Alto is a great community. And I currently live right on, my backyard is right next to the railroad tracks. So this is gonna impact me directly, and it impacts all, of the, all the citizens of Palo Alto. Um, I, I wanna thank you for today about uh, a lot of these graphics. It really helps in looking at the different options and so forth. I still believe that uh, the trench is really the best option. Um, I'm sticking with that. Uh, and one of the main reasons is noise and vibration and also uh, visually. Um, also a little bit about, you know, uh, bike safety and so, so forth. Um, you know, I've been to a bunch of, com I believe that the trench is what the community wants. Uh, there is a petition out there uh, that, that wants to, d is against r all raised options. Uh, I've been to many community meetings and um, uh, a lot of what I get feedback is a lot of people like the trench uh, and I still believe it is the best option. Um, it was disappointing last meeting that the trench was not a true option uh, for they have to overcome some of the setbacks with the creeks and also with uh, the 2% approval. Uh, this project that the citizen, you know, this project affects all the citizens and, and the future generations have to live with. I think it is important to make the right decision, the decision that the community wants. I hope that the city will work to make the trench a true option. And what I mean by that is, is you know, make sure that they get these exceptions uh, through. Uh, to sum it up, uh, the trench may be a hard option, but I believe it's the best option, and the city should put forth the effort to make it a true option. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herzl. Uh, Bonnie Parker, to be followed by uh, Ellen Hartog. Hi, actually it's Bonnie Park. Bonnie Parker was a notorious criminal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, first, uh, I uh, am a research scientist at NASA Ames, and I live in South Palo Alto, and I travel the length of uh, Alma all the way to Moffat. So I've done this for over 20 years, so I feel really familiar with the whole stretch. The I want to thank uh, you, Lydia, for talking about the tunnel option and saying, well, it's really not completely off. And Adrian wrote me a very nice email saying that we haven't, we're still considering the tunnel as an option and doing our due diligence on it. And I was very glad to hear that. However, when I came in today, I sat down and the gentleman next to me said, well, that's out. <laughs> the tunnel is out. It is so expensive. So. I, being in Palo Alto for so long, I realized that the land is so valuable, it seems to me that if we could build, if we had a tunnel and could build on that land, that would help reimburse us. Uh, now, so uh, Adrian said that in fact the city doesn't own the land. 
So I just wonder if, in fact, all of the possible deal-making has gone on there with the people that do own the land. Uh, I think that this will be brought up at all of the community me meetings, because everyone realizes the price of land around here is really high. Uh, the, uh, there are bond issues. There, uh, this possibility of state funding when Jerry Brown goes, uh, he's very much attached to his big rail, high-speed railroad, and who knows, maybe someone can divert some of that funding to this very important uh, intercity, inter shorter span option. The, uh, uh, the Boring Company, I was really pleased to hear that Adrian has contacted the Boring Company, and even though, uh, they, well, they're having a demo project, starts the 10th of December in LA with their tunnels, and it seems to me that even though Adrian said they're not there, they've indicated they're not quite ready for a project like this, hey, maybe their lead engineer could be co-opted at least investigate the possibility of a tunnel like that. And it seems to me that the city of Palo Alto should surely pay for you guys to go down there and see that demo. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen Hartog to be followed by Jim Silver. Good morning, thank you for all your hard work. Um, I appreciate the letter you wrote for the exemptions and height reductions of the trains and um, that you are following up on below grade options. And um, I would like to ask that you also maybe recommend that the freight stay at grade and the train go below grade because I think that was probably some of the uh, problems with going with a 2% grade and we haven't recommend, had that recommendation to city council to study. So as far as above grade, I'm very concerned about the environmental issues to health with noise, vibration, especially the quality of life and uh, the site unsightliness of concrete uh, embankments and uh, the height issues. There are so many um, cons to those scenarios that um, the neighborhoods really would suffer from. And it is impactful, even though you're saving in traffic, in money, our quality of life in the future hundreds of years to come, we're making those types of decisions today. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Jim Silver to be followed by Steve Jennings. Jim Silver. All right, uh, Steve Jennings to be followed by uh, Davina Brown. Good morning, I'm Steve Jennings. I live at 369 Wickland Drive. Um, our house is situated about uh, 100 yards from Adobe Creek and we are upstream of Alma and the rail um, crossing. So I'm kind of interested in exactly what would be involved in rerouting Adobe Creek um, if a trench option is adopted. It appears to me that uh, just from an eyeball glance at the proximity of Adobe Creek to Charleston Road that that would be a pretty major undertaking and I think it may be important to know more about what might be involved with that. Thank you. Thank you. Davina Brown to be followed by Nadia Nayak. Good morning. Um, I've been here before and I thank you for your service. I still feel that below ground option is here for our whole community for now and forevermore. This is not a decision for today. I'm old, I probably even won't be here to worry about how high and ugly it is, you know. But on the trench, we were shown only one pro site. 
Well, sound mitigation, safety, ease of passage by bikes and pedestrians are all pros for doing below ground. Um, the trenches now and forever. Um, the problem with the engineering and money is silly. We have some of the brightest people in the world living in this area. To tell me we can't solve an engineering problem about creeks is not realistic. You know, we have brainy people. And as far as money, you know, we always find it. They just redid Ross Road for a bike boulevard for over a million dollars. You know, to find money for what we need, we will solve the problem. Let's do what the community wants, put the train under the road level. Thank you. Thank you, Davina. Nadia Naik to be followed by uh, Kershaw Gandhi. Hi. Um, so I, we've looked at the issue of the creeks and how to get under it with a trench in 2014. Um, for those of you in the audience who've tried to find this, I had a hard time finding it. Um, it actually, there was no rail committee meetings in 2014, so you have to go to the city council website for 2014 and look at their October 14th meeting. And that's where you could see the plans that Hatch Mott McDonald had originally drawn for a trench and how they got under the different creeks. I would love to hear um, from the consultants what the difference is in how Hatch Mott seemed to be able to get under the creeks versus what's being proposed today because I don't understand the differences and there's no good diagrams in Hatch Mott's old work to, to be able to distinguish from what AECOM is proposing. So I think that's a really important thing. Um, as a CAP member, I um, also want to apologize because I, the meetings that we're having are not really set up in a way to give a lot of feedback to what we've seen. So yes, we've reviewed all of those videos, but if you go back and watch the CAP meeting video, you can see that we had a meeting for, of two hours and 10 minutes and not much time to get much in. Um, I'm most concerned about the fact that the videos that we do have don't reflect the creeks in the video, and specifically that while we seem to have two alternatives for a viaduct, which I think is great, I don't think we have enough clarification around the creek issue for the trench, which may or may not be a poison pill on this issue. And considering that it is the community favorite, I'm concerned that you know we're going into a community meeting in two weeks. If we don't really flesh out what's happening there, the community is again going to feel that this community meeting is biased in a particular way. I think the previous speaker talked about the fact that the pros and cons list for the trench has a single pro and lots of cons. I'd be surprised that we can at least show that there are more pros of the trench. I mean, clearly it's a community favorite because there's other things that are considered positive. And if we go to these community meetings and don't provide a more balanced approach, it's going to be, it's not going to be received well. Um, as someone who participated, has been doing this for a while, as you know, I'm, I'm always really sensitive to how we present things to the community, and I know you guys are doing a lot of hard work, and I think these videos are super helpful for the community to understand what's happening, but we have to be really measured and careful that we're showing these things equally. Um, lastly, I'm wondering if there's any geotechnical information that we might have from any previous project we've done in Palo Alto to give us some kind of inkling of what the soils are along the right of way that may or may not present any problems with the trench or tunnel options going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Christian Gandhi, to be followed by Florence Keller. Good morning. My name is Kurshid Gandhi, and first off, of course, I thank everybody, including um, the ACOM guys, for the presentation. It was very helpful to actually see the thing happening. I would echo Lydia, and next time that you have these, please actually have the trains on there and the poles on there rather than just the structures, because that will give us a better idea of how tall something might or might not be. Uh, I live at Charleston Meadows. I would want to put a plug in again. We, our community is strongly for bearing the train. We've gone through lots of issues with the train, um, with students, high school students, et cetera. We would really like the train out of sight. We understand how important Caltrain is. We are not trying to make that go away. We would just like to maintain our community feel. We want the train to work. We love taking the train to San Francisco when we can but we don't particularly want it over our heads. Our beeping right now was bad enough. Imagine the noise pollution that's gonna happen with the train high up there, with the frequency increased by Caltrain. 
imagine the noise when the freight goes over, it's pretty heavy and clunky, and the vibrations they're off. So if this beeping was bad for the last 15 minutes, imagine having to live with that for the next 100 years. Uh, just saying. Um, I actually really uh, also echoed Lydia's uh, solution of trying to either move the viaduct or the trench to the middle of Alma, so we have a lane going, you know, one way direction either side. That would mitigate the, what do you call it, the subsurface acquisition that you would need, because then the subsurface acquisition is under the road and not in people's backyards. We don't have to deal with the shrubbery and all those different cons that are there. Again, I'd echo another resident saying we could probably figure out the engineering uh, living in this area. Um, the last thing that I would like to bring up is that uh, among the, all the safety mitigations, you talked about uh, flooding as a con for the trench and so on and so forth. I'd also like to see some safety mitigations for earthquakes uh, when we have an elevated structure. Uh, I did not see any of that. We'd probably need walls or something else and how that is going to affect the cost because from personal experience, we're just trying to earthquake-proof a house. Anytime you try to earthquake-proof anything, the cost goes up radically. So I would like to see some information on that. I think we've been in a drought long enough. People are more worried about the earthquakes than flooding at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Florence Keller to be followed by Cedric. Uh, Good morning, my name is Florence Keller. You know, I've been to a few of these meetings and the engineers talk above my head, but there seems to be no discussion of psychosocial costs. And surely in this town, we are sophisticated enough to recognize that it's not simply engineering costs that we should be concerned about. So you were all good enough to spend a lot of time and energy avoiding eminent domain. So you said to Churchill residents, we're gonna spare you eminent domain. Well, you may not have to take anybody's houses, but, but can anybody live in those houses, really? Can you live in a house with the acoustical blight, the visual blight? Maybe some takings, I don't know. So it might be kinder to take the housing. I wrote a letter last night, Adrian, you were kind enough to let me know you'd received it, in which I suggest, I told you that there are two houses currently for sale right on the tracks, right across from Robles Park between Charleston and Meadow. They are not selling. They've reduced their prices. So even financially, the hit is going to be, guess where, ladies and gentlemen, South Palo Alto. Really? So maybe next prayer time we can have an expert on what the implications of all of these different possibilities are on style of life. Nobody's paying attention to that cost. I hope in the future we will. Thank you. Thank you. Cedric to be followed by Roland Laverne. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Cedric de la Beaujardière. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple questions uh, for the trench. Um, how far back from the trench would the tree exclusion zone extend as a function of the track depth? Um, and what is the distance of the western trench wall from the western right-of-way boundary uh, south of Meadow? Um, I think the 3D animations for the trench should show the uh, impact of the trees cleared from people's backyards where they're affected, since that's a big uh, impact for those residents. And also the, three, the 3D animation should show the impacts to the creek. Uh, for the viaduct, um, are you, uh, for the option that doesn't require the shoe fly track, uh, will your cost estimate in, uh, be adjusted accordingly so you don't have to pay for that uh, shoe fly track? Um, and then the visual impacts, it really the, uh, the impacts or the benefits if it's a, um, elevated or dropped, um, those depend on, how, uh, uh, depend on how close you are to the intersection. So if you're 1,000 feet away from the intersection with the viaduct, then the train might be only uh, five feet off the ground. Um, so it'd be great to have a, a map of the homes and uh, grade them depending on um, how high the uh, structure is behind them or how low the thing is behind them. Um, 
And uh, noise and vibration impacts of elevated rail can be successfully mitigated. There are uh, proven uh, utilized designs in other parts of the world that have been shown to reduce the sound by 20 dB, which is the equivalent of reducing the sound by 75% uh, from the level of the train on an elevated structure without those mitigations. So that's a significant uh, reduction of uh, noise from even current conditions. Um, and, um, and let's see, uh, viaduct is obviously the best from a bike and pedestrian crossing perspective since they can cross at grade. Um, in the option that has, uh, uh, retains the western track, uh, the freight could potentially stay at grade uh, in that option. Um, uh, presumably all engineering requirements for elevated rails uh, take into account earthquake safety in California. Um, and for the, safe, uh, for the savings that you would achieve by not going the astronomically priced route, uh, you could invest some of those savings towards, uh, for instance, uh, 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 in installing sound insulation for homes. Uh, you could have a revolving fund to purchase people's homes that are, uh, you know, say two years to decide, I really can't live with this thing back here, well, we'll buy your home uh, at, a, at a generous price and sell it to someone who doesn't have that issue. Um, and then finally, I think as a council, you get, you're considering these uh, choices in the absence of all other city considerations and needs uh, and future needs that the city may, might face. So, you know, we, know, we have, at least at the beginning of the year, we had a $56 million shortfall for infrastructure and the city's freaking out about that and how do we address that. Uh, there are future needs of, uh, you know, uh, climate mitigation, uh, climate adaptation, um, and uh, these needs uh, would help all the city's residents, not the not just the 200 or so uh, residents that cl live closest to the intersections. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Cedric. Final speaker, Roland LeBrun. Thank you. So uh, very briefly, I'd like to talk about um, design speed versus operating speed. And typically, the design speed has got to be 10% higher than the operating speed. And my understanding is that Caltrain and high-speed rail intend to operate at 110. You would therefore derive from that that this design speed should actually be 125, not 110. I'll give you a couple of examples. The high-speed rail authority in, intends to operate at 220 miles an hour in the Central Valley. They're actually designing for 250. The speed limit in the high-speed tunnels in London is 147 miles an hour, we had to test them at 165. So in, in closing, my advice is to go back and revisit this because I believe that designing 410 is incorrect. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, let's bring it back to committee members. Uh, any additional comments or thoughts? Uh, and <coughs> is staff looking for real action on this item? Do you want to clarify what you're looking for? from us for. Um, thank you, Chair Warbuck. Uh, so really feedback on the information we've presented you with a, a lot of information. Hopefully it's helpful to get a better sense of these three options, particularly the visuals and as consultant team staff been doing a lot of, of work on this. Um, so mainly it's, it's feedback on these options, questions, uh, particularly uh, frequently asked questions that you might think ought to be added to the, the public uh, website. Um, as far as narrowing the field of uh, alternatives for these two crossings, that's really at the, at the committee's pleasure. Staff's perspective on, on this is that there's still some additional na analysis to be done on these options, particularly around cost. So to uh, eliminate an option uh, today, um, we would recommend that um, you know, we look to doing that in, in December after we've had the community meeting. Uh, we plan to have a, an additional CAP meeting uh, the CAP asked for that, and they've been terrific, uh, and we've given them a lot of information. So having a second meeting, uh, particularly on these southern crossings, so we, they can absorb that information even better. And then when we're back um, with the full council on December 17th would be, you know, uh, probably more appropriate time to narrow the, the alternatives. So that's where staff is. Adrian? Um, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for speaking up today. A um, number of comments and some questions. First of all, I think uh, Councilmember Ku had two good questions. I want to 
align myself with one is kind of the option of moving the viaduct to the east, kind of more centrally located, um, and seeing what that would look like for our residents. And I think especially given the visual diagrams, that might be helpful. And the other issue she raised was kind of elevations of the full height of these systems, whether it's a berm, fence, catenary, train, whatever else, uh, whether other, other options are there, just kind of giving people an idea of, of what it looks like. Um, you know, maybe it's both from the Park Boulevard side and from the Alma side, I think those are, would be helpful. Um, can we go back to the evaluation matrix? Um, thank you. So I, I think this is a good start, and I remember a few months ago, or maybe it was last year, we saw a similar one from either Belmont or San Carlos. Um, and this is a nice way to begin looking at it. I look forward to us filling in the rest of the bubbles here. Um, and I'd also encourage us to, you know, do this across all the other alternatives we've looked at, both for Palo Alto Ave and Churchill. Um, I think that's helpful. So I'm just trying to read the rest of this. Um, did the CAP have any feedback on this? Uh, the CAP did have feedback on this. They saw it last week on the 7th when we met. I think the initial reaction was definitely they uh, appreciated it, liked it more than the previous matrix we had, which is pretty complicated to, yep. to understand. Um, Eddie might have some additional information about specific feedback. We did talk about the grading and how, you know, we've got whatever that is, six or seven grades there, and does it make sense to have that many or fewer? That was some of the feedback. It's, a wor it's definitely a work in progress. Yeah, I'm going to add on to that. Hi, I'm Millette with AECOM. And um, one of our homework assignments is to fill in the coloring for this um, evaluation criteria and get it out back out to the CAP so they can take a look at it before it goes um, to the community. So that's one of our homework assignments um, to do that. Okay. Uh, I would put forth that um, it's probably better in this community to actually uh, beef this up and add more rows rather than take them away. And a few that come to mind to me immediately actually, uh, I think one that's missing here is kind of the water impact issues. Just today we've already heard that some of these options have uh, greater impacts on whether it's groundwater, the creeks, things like that. Um, and the other one somebody brought up, I appreciated it, um, was kind of what they called the psychosocial costs. Um, I think that's an interesting way of looking at these. Um, and. I think it probably will take a bit more of a workup for us to understand what that means, whether it's you know a combination of visual, noise, sight impacts, but also you know whether people can bike across it and feel safe and happy, um, what it means to live near these, these options, what it means to drive by them. And I think that might be another way to cut across these. Um, the more quantitative we can get on each of these options, that's helpful. I understand not all of them uh, fall into those categories. Um, um, could I comment on what you've Please. commented on so far? So when we did present this to the CAP, we did have an additional slide that we kind of had put, um, I think, technical considerations or something like that. Um, in conversations with staff, they felt like that was a little bit confusing in the sense that we really want to stick to the adopted criteria and that those other categories of technical, we would try to capture those in the pros and cons. So um, that was our direction. Okay, um, I hear that. I, I just find this somewhat useful and kind of digestible across multiple options. So I think that's useful. Um, quick question around order of magnitude of costs. Um, are we planning to just kind of like ballpark and say this one's going to be two hundred million? That's going to be two hundred fifty million. What, what, I mean, I just I just figure our cost estimation is going to be a little more complicated than that. I was hoping you could illustrate it. It, it is. It is more complicated than that. That's why it's taking us a little bit. Am I on? A l longer to do, but we're really trying to look at what are the various factors associated uh, with the cost of each alternative. You know, what's the cost of the structure? What's the cost to mitigate, you know, creeks 
you know, and, and um, looking at utilities and trying to really capture what we know today, but, they're the, but there are also still unknowns. a lot of unknowns uh, that we have to try and capture through a, you know, a contingency uh, evaluation. But it does have backup and we're following, uh, to, you know, to follow a, a cost estimating procedure, we're following Caltrans's project study report procedures for cost estimating at this level of engineering um, just to follow something, a, a practice um, as well, so. Okay, so on this document, there may be, you know, one big cost number, but I think it's important for us to break that out, whether it's construction costs, process costs, mitigation costs, uh, hard costs, soft costs, and just get an idea of, of where each of those falls. Um, a few members of the public have mentioned issues such as sound, bike, ped connectivity, and that makes me think of, you know, the impetus for this whole project is kind of east-west connectivity in the city, and I think it's also important for us to contemplate uh, future connectivity, right? So somebody did mention that with the viaduct, we may have easier options for bike, bicycle connectivity across town. Um, that may also be true for the trench, right? Uh, I was thinking, you know, over many years, we've talked about a potential bike connection at Loma Verde, and maybe the trench enables us to do that. And so um, evaluating those kind of like downstream opportunities or lack there, thereof, I think is important. Um, and then just two last points, and then I want to turn it over to my colleagues. Two areas I think we need a bit more work up. Uh, so one is kind of on whether it's pumping issues or water issues with these various options. Um, I don't think we yet have a great sense of what that looks like for each of them. And then the other, it's not really on the agenda today, but I'll just say, uh, you know, people keep on talking about the tunnel and, um, we all should work with staff on kind of developing that option so we kind of have an idea to some of the, these big questions that folks are asking about, whether it's you know ownership, what are the fatal flaws, development potential, cost, et cetera. And we may need to rehash our, our white paper on that and make it a bit more um, useful at this point. Um, I think those are my comments for now, but I'll probably have more to say after hearing from you all. Lydia? So thank you, Adrian, for bringing up some points. I think um, one of the things that I'd really like to see is that um, in addition to the 3D animation of the height of um, the viaduct as well as um, the poles and even the uh, hybrid option, it would be nice to have um, to, to include story poles so it's actually a physical life um, structure that people can actually drive by and see and actually observe the height of what they're going to be dealing with. So 3D animation is beautiful and it's absolutely great, but I think you, we need that physical uh, structure to show. And for those people that are living by these, um, by this um, uh, tracks, they need to know also how it's going to affect them. Um, then also in, in all of this, um, you know, there's some road enhancement and modifications along Charleston. Um, so how is that integrated into your um, circulation studies over here for flow? Um, so it would be nice to have that added onto um, the, um, your, your diagrams as well as your matrix and evaluations in terms of cir um, circulation. And I did hear in the um, meeting, the CAP meeting, that somewhere in one of Josh Mello's presentation that, you know, with the Charleston Road modification and the grade crossing, it might induce a 30% increase of traffic. So we want to know for sure how that affects this um, this this uh, intersection as well as East Meadow, because we're not, you know it's it's more than just uh, great separation. It's also continuing the flow of this uh, of these streets. So we want to have circulation and not to have traffic. If we're doing all this and putting in all this money, then we certainly want to ensure that traffic is flowing and it's moving. Um, with Loma Verde, I'd like to see that added onto your, um, into your work over here, simply because if it, it's something that's gonna be proposed for a bicycle um, pathway, we want people to know what, how that's gonna look. Um, on the viaduct, is there emergency exits that, that needs to be put in, um, that needs to be included? 
Eddie? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, all of the alternatives have to look at emergency egress in, uh, um, for uh, in a case a train is stranded. So whether it's the viaduct or the trench, uh, we'd be looking at those and where those would be need to be located. Uh, as a minimum, uh, the, 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 the width of the, uh, that we're considering um, has a walkways on both sides which are required um, by um, the regulatory agencies in case of a, a train that people need to exit. So there's a towpath on the outside of whatever um, alternative that we're looking at. Uh, and, and also there's the pump stations and what was that that Caltrain was calling the electric little house? Um, I don't know the technical name, but they have a, a power station or something like that. That is, um, is that something that's going to be necessary for all the options that's been named over here? And where will they be at all the different points along this? Oh, we, we don't. Sh uh, we, we can pump have the, stations. I, I, I assume you're referring to substations. Is uh, it substations? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yeah. Um, that's but, where they have their power and then right so it's a, their substations are located fairly uh, far apart but we will work with Caltrain if to see if there's a substation within this uh, reach and we would have to accommodate that substation and it would be the same issue for all three alternatives is there's a substation okay. in the area um, also so with the um, hybrid is that going to provide enough clearance for emergency vehicles like fire um, or fire engines and the 15 and a half feet clearance, that's the, the, the standard? Ladder. Correct. It does provide for clearance uh, for uh, uh, emergency vehicles, buses, um, uh, trucks. Uh, so that is a standard vertical clearance. Uh, and it's used throughout the Caltrain system. And it's also used uh, throughout uh, cities and counties. Um, Caltrans has higher ones on freeways, but this is local streets. So 15 and a half feet is more than adequate for uh, any type of vehicle that you'll um, encounter in a city. Okay, and in the uh, CAP meeting, you mentioned something about inverted siphons. What are those? Um, that goes, I think, back to the question that is a solution, uh, and we're still looking into that, a solution of how you can take a creek from one side of a trench to another. Um, is, so, and the, what, one of the uh, uh, questions from the CAP is what does that look like, and we're um, developing those. Again, those are are not looked on favorably from uh, water uh, agencies because they have very, very high maintenance issues. Um, and if you have sediment buildup or something and it's not maintained, then you have the potential for um, flooding upstream. Um, so it's, it's, it's a solution that we're looking into. And again, we'll bring that back as to what that looks like. But it's, uh, that's a type of way to, um, an engineering method of dealing with the creek. Okay. Um, so Rob and Ed, I haven't had the chance to read the letters that came back from everybody from Santa Clara Water District and everything. Can you kind of give us a, you know, um, summary of what they're saying here, especially with the Santa Clara Water District and then also the response? I, I actually believe Etty just did. In terms she, of how she described, you know, some of the uh, issues that uh, are of concern to the water district, in particular as it relates to the trench, I think that on the other alternatives, it, it looked like they didn't raise any specific issues, at least as I'm recalling. So based on this letter, you have incorporated into your presentation for the 28th and today? And today? As noted, no, the, the presentation we have right now does not show the inverted siphons in it. It's something we have to uh, continue to uh, evaluate and see whether we have the right of way to do it, and if we don't, what those impacts to right of way. Um, and there are other drainage facilities in there that we have to consider. There's, a, I think, an 84-inch uh, large diameter drainage pipe that's coming from Mountain View that uh, discharges into uh, the Southerly Creek, and I'm drawing a blank on that one. <laughs> um, so so we're, we're evaluating, and that will actually go into our construction cost estimate um, as we look at those uh, issues and um, identify them and kind of get our hands around them. Okay. Um, thank you. So lastly, I just want to say that um, I think we all have to be cognizant that it's easy just to talk about noise and vibrations, especially when we're not living right behind these uh, noise and vibrations or even privacy um, issues. Uh, I just hope that as we move along that 
we do no harm. And I think that's really important to continue to remember that um, we don't let others take on something that we would not want to have to live with. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I actually wanted to reiterate what some of the things Adrian said too, which was the notion of downstream opportunities. I think that as we build this, I think we need to give more weight to thinking about what that looks like in the future um, in terms of connectivity, in terms of bike and pedestrian paths, that kind of thing. Um, the more I think about the viaduct, I, I think we need pictures. Has, has anyone built a viaduct that we could look at and say, yeah, there's a viaduct. I mean, I'm thinking about you have a 10-foot sound wall 21 feet high in the air, right? And I, I guess part of it is how long does that run? I mean, that it's not really the 21 feet to think because you have a sound wall above that, at least, right? So the sound wall is probably, what, 10 feet? I don't, I don't know how big a sound wall, 8 feet, right? So, I mean, you're starting to get 31 feet and you have, so you, and then, so you basically have this obstruction running in the sky. Um, so I think if there are pictures of people who've actually built viaducts, I think that would be really helpful um, to take a look at that. Because it's sort of hard to visualize how that looks. Um, at least it is for me. I think I wanted to understand a little bit more. When we look at the trench, you have so many cons here necessary. I mean, I, I think I'd like to understand when it says, in every little thing, it says, um, first of all, there's the basements under the houses. We, we would basically just restrict people from, from, from building basements there, from building pools. Is that an easement you put on their property, or is that, a, or is that, a, or is that just basically a new regulation we pass? Um, is it a taking? Is it not a taking? You know, what, is that, what does that kind of look like for people? Um, are there other unintended consequences that if you have an easement that is a no-build situation, and if there's a no-build situation, sometimes you're not allowed to include that in terms of your FAR, and I mean, I think we need to take a look and see what does this mean for, for individual people that live there and given our regulations. Um, when we talk about, um, I guess, plants in the backyard and, and that kind of stuff, I mean, I guess all of that, what that means to the people that would live there if we, if we did the trench. And then we talk about needing, um, what was it, um, pumping stations. We talked about um, right-of-way will need to be acquired. I assume that's taking land for, the, for that. Whose land are we taking for those pumping stations? Are they houses? Are they, are they just land that's not being used? I mean, what do we mean by that? I mean, it's a, it's a simple sentence, but do we know? We're taking, that's again a part of our evaluation. We're looking at where we need pumping plants and if we can fit those pumping plants potentially within the Caltrain right-of-way would be our first, uh, uh, I, I guess, our first... Uh, uh, preference. <laughs> preference, thank you. <laughs> and, and then if, if, if not there, maybe, you know, encroaching into the roadway. And the last uh, result would be looking at private property. Uh, those pumping plants can be, you know, fairly large structures. Um, and uh, part of that is going to be a conversation since we're going to be pumping uh, stuff out of the, for the trench, you know, out of the uh, uh, trench itself is, you know, what storm event we have to pump for, and then that will house the, that will determine the size of the, of the pump plant itself and whether we need to store it. I designed a pump plant uh, that was on Mission Boulevard that was a structure that required uh, three six-foot diameter pipes underneath the roadway for storage capacity, but the house itself was more like a, a 20 by 10 by 10 uh, structure. So, uh, like, a, I don't know if there's, anyhow, where I live, there's pumping plants all over the, because we have a lot of groundwater pumping there. Uh, so those are, they're, they're like little uh, tools, uh, like tough sheds, yeah, they could be that, about that size. Okay. And then I think the maintenance issues, we shouldn't, we should think about those long term. I mean. You know, we talk about these different options having different costs. So what is the magnitude on a yearly basis of that we would be adding to our budget on maintenance? And I think that's a significant, significant issue and that we should look at and, and take, that, take that one fairly seriously. Um, 
and I think when we talk, when we think about the groundwater pumping, I think the community has raised a lot of questions about basements and, and pumping water and hydrology and, and all of that. This seems like a much more massive pumping operation, but maybe I'm wrong. And I guess all those questions would need to be looked at as well, and they seem, they seem rather significant. Um, and since a lot of these are aesthetic questions, I really do think the more we can hone in on what does the viaduct look like, what does the hybrid solution look like, I mean, how unattractive or attractive is it going to be, what are things you can do to make it more attractive, um, and then in the trench, I do think there's so many, so many questions here we're going to need to really delve into. Um, and I guess on the viaduct, I was a little surprised. You need a 1.4% design except grade, right, <coughs> exception. If you don't get that, the viaduct is just not feasible at that point. The viaduct requires, <clears throat> uh, the viaduct yeah. requires a 1.4. Right, so if you don't get the 1.4, it's not feasible. Correct. Um, now, to, to that extent, uh, we have talked to Caltrain. Caltrain has approved a 1.3 for San Bruno. Okay. So, you know, they do, and it's also, again, as, as uh, Caltrain points out, any design exception is on a case-by-case -case basis, so you have to make the case for each one to show that, that there, there is no other option for that. So, so there is no other option. We, when Caltrain says there is no other option, do they mean, like, no other option with a, doing the viaduct, or do they mean no other option by, like, yeah, you guys we, could do a hybrid and not need it? Um, Caltrain still owes us the procedure for their design exception, so um, we will be getting that and find out what that, what that means from them. Good, because, I mean, obviously, the question is how much money do you have to spend? Say the community decided they wanted a viaduct option. You know, how much money do you spend going through design before Caltrain tells you, no, sorry, you can't do that. You're going to have to mm -hmm. do something else. I mean, that's, that's obviously a clear concern. Um, in terms of the, in terms of the, the trench issue, um, <coughs> how, when we talk about like major utility relocations for utilities along the Caltrain corridor, I, I guess there are so many of these things, how are we going to put some color to them? Like, is major utility relocations, is it a cost issue or is it, beyond a cost issue, like, you know, you have to get approvals from X number of, and you're unlikely to get them. I mean, so I think there's, there's cost issues and there's also the ability to get something done. Um, the creek stuff, I mean, the, some speakers talked about, well, this is Silicon Valley, we should be able to solve the engineering. But it's not just an engineering challenge, it's a regulatory challenge, because there's so many people get involved in creeks. So I think we need to break out some of these challenges so the community can understand it so that we can understand if we were to move with a trench, what are the steps it would take? What does that look like from a planning process? Because um, frankly, at the moment, there's so many of these large issues, it's unclear which are issues that we think we can overcome in a feasible, or we think these are going to be really challenging to overcome. And you know, we get to this point. I, I think we're going to have to break some of that out. All right, I think that's pretty much what I had. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, in our next item, we're going to be talking about um, the idea of doing a subsurface passenger option while leaving freight at the surface and basically bifurcating freight service from the passenger service. Um, has there been any thought about whether that's feasible, possible, recommended, an option for the above surface ones we're looking at. I mean, as there, you know, what would a viaduct or a hybrid look like if it was carrying passengers only as opposed to carrying freight, right? How, how much less substantial a visual impact and noise impact does it say a viaduct with passenger only have well, versus one with freight? And, 
is that worth considering? Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, it is a, a slide in our next uh, agenda item uh, on that. And, but just to, a quick answer on that is we have requested Caltrain. They are designing a portion of their line without freight, which is in the most northern end as they go into the Transbay Terminal. And uh, they have indicated to us they will get us that design criteria that they have, which is a starting point for us to you know, take a look at where they are currently designing for their passenger rail without freight. That's great. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, Adrian? Just a few more. Um, some of your comments triggered a few thoughts. Uh, one, so like Council Member Scharf, I actually had uh, a kind of hard time understanding some of the negatives on, on some of the options. And one that I thought was especially hard to understand was kind of the construction phasing. Um, so while, while the visuals and the videos were super helpful, I think it may be nice to just kind of get a bulleted list of how construction will be phased in and what happens when and why for each of the alternatives. Um, just I had a hard, hard time kind of following like, you know, the right lane is, is closed on Alma and then we lower this and then we move that. Um, so that might be useful. Um, Councilmember Sharp also had some good points about the trench and kind of property impacts or potential property impacts and it may be, may be helpful for us to kind of work up a worst case scenario of property impacts, what that might mean for a resident along Park Boulevard, for example, um, what regulations the city might need to put in place and what mitigations we may be able to offer, just so we kind of have a worst case idea of what that could be. Um, also questions about maintenance long term. And the final one, um, another factor we're not really considering here, um, and I'll just put it out there, is, is our sustainability and climate action plan and what these different alternatives look like with regards to that. We are kind of considering them against our comprehensive plan and other community <laughs> inputs, um, but with our recently passed SCAP, um, if there is a way to evaluate these alternatives against it, um, that may be helpful for us too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one speaker who'd like to speak still to this item before we move on to number two. Okay, uh, two speakers, you'll have two minutes each. Gary Lindgren and Cedric, uh, I'm sorry, Cedric, I still haven't figured out how to pronounce your last name, I apologize. Um, many residents are, are worried that either Palo Alto Avenue or um, Churchill, or both, or, or both. Speaking of the mic, thanks. Pull the mic down if you want. Yeah, uh, many residents are worried that either Palo Alto Avenue or um, Churchill may be uh, closed. There is a way to keep both of them open, starting with the hybrid crossing at Palo Alto Avenue and then elevating the track level going past the train station at a 1% uh, grade or less, past Embarcadero and reaching a track height of 21 feet above grade at Churchill. In this case, both Palo Alto Avenue and Churchill would be kept open. With these roads opened, there would be no need to widen the Embarcadero underpass at this time but any changes in the area should be consistent with a wider underpass at a future date. The raised viaduct would then be continue beyond Churchill past Oregon Expressway, Meadow and Charleston, then slowly taper down to grade at San Antonio. I've heard that the council has some ideas about changing University Avenue and uh, let us have a complete solution for Palo Alto's grade crossings and include both University and Barcadero as part of this solution. The extra time to study this will be well worth it in a long time. Now, uh, in addition, there's a, a good way to uh, compare um, the viaduct and the hybrid. With the uh, hybrid, you have a dirt berm, which you can't see through. With the viaduct, you have five feet higher, but you can see through and you, have, you get some use underneath the viaduct, say, for a park or, uh, say, a bike path and uh, uh, that, that has a definite advantage. Thank you. Thank you. Cedric, to be followed by Ellen Hartog. Uh, so sorry, speaker. just a, a, a couple more things. Um, uh, regarding the impacts, I think it'd be good to show uh, the impacts uh, for people living near the pump stations. Um, presumably those will run uh, night and day 24-7, whereas the trains don't run late at night. 
and then of course sound carries much greater uh, distance uh, at night when it's quiet. So there's a uh, potentially significant um, impact. Um, also the impact should include the amount of water, uh, the wastewater pumped out of the ground water. Um, how many gallons per year uh, might that Im um, Im Im imply? And then are there any potential problems with properties subsiding above the water table that's pumped dry? And then finally, I'd, I'd love it, uh, the consultant, if you could answer the questions I asked earlier. Um, how far back from the trench would the tree exclusion zone extend as a function of the track depth? And what is the distance of the western track wall from the western right of way boundary south of Meadow? I'd appreciate having those answers, thank you. I'm sure the other nearby residents would like to know that as well. Thank you. Ellen Hartog, last speaker for this item. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I am in support of separating the passenger from the freight and having a freight at, on, at grade and passenger obviously underground. Thank you. And that will take us to our next item. Oh. Oh. All right, uh, Lydia, you have a question, and then staff and consultant team might want to respond to um, any I comments. Think, is heard. this the question about the distance? Uh, the d will uh, to answer your question on the distances for from the um, walls to the property lines. I think that goes back to I think to the uh, one of the suggestions from the count, uh, the rail committee uh, is to create an exhibit and we'll be working on that to show where the ground anchors are relative to property lines and where the relative to other facilities. So I, that, that'll be an exhibit we're working on and that'll go directly to uh, answering the question that the uh, public had about what those distance ours is are. So, and it will also show what, uh, what you also uh, requested is heights as well. So we'll get those dimensions onto our exhibits that we'll be preparing here. Uh, Lydia, do you have any other questions? Just one very quickly. Um, with the viaduct, you've taken into consideration, um, even though it's open in, in certain areas that you can see through, that the freight train with uh, what it carries and its load, and it, it can support that, right? Yes. All our so it, doesn't, it yes. doesn't have to be solid wall? Correct. Okay. So all of our uh, alternative analysis it considers the seismic criteria that we need to design for with you know in, in California as well as um, we're considering that the freight uh, whatever those characteristics that are in the design criteria required for freight are included into those alternatives so that we're comparing apples and apples one alternative does not they all consider those uh, factors into that thank you thank you Corey Sure, uh, we'll actually take a quick five minute break, exactly five minutes, and we'll move on to item number two. All right, let's bring the meeting back to order, move on to item number two. So item number two is uh, project schedule and work plan update, including discussion of the idea for freight train on the surface and passenger train underground. And I will turn to staff and consulting team um, and we will get through this item as well. Staff? Yep, so thank you, Chair Walbuck. So we're, now we're talking about the work plan. This is sort of more of a standing item and we think we have to have it every meeting just because there's so many moving parts and so many different committees from the CAP committee and the TAC committee. And you'll be glad to hear that we pulled the TAC back together this last, last month. We also have stakeholder meetings that we're having with different organizations like the Water District and other things. So just keeping the, the schedule updated, uh, it does change a little bit and we have that as it's just a standing item on the agenda. So um, that's what this is about. I'll pass it on to Eddie just to walk through uh, all of the activities that are happening <coughs> this month, December, January, and then ultimately February, which is our, our goal of having a preferred solution um, for council consideration. Okay, great. Thank you um, again. So this, uh, this is the uh, 
schedule that I, I put up earlier in the previous presentation. Uh, we're in the month of November. We've had a lot of activity. Um, and I'm just going to kind of walk through uh, the activities for uh, November uh, is uh, December, January, and February that we are anticipating to be completing during this time period. So in November has been a very, very busy month. Uh, we had a CAP meeting, and um, Millette here will give an update of overview of the CAP here in a little bit, and the, um, uh, that was on November 7th. Uh, we ha today we're at the rail committee meeting here. Uh, at the CAP meeting, we reviewed some of the alternatives that we saw today. We looked at the evaluation me ma matrix. Uh, we talked briefly about the traffic. Uh, the traffic update is we're actually in the process of doing data collection, um, and the analysis will be done in the next month. Um, and then we had our uh, uh, Alta planning is our and our team, and they are going to be giving us a uh, bicycle ped. Um, uh, input and they're be preparing some exhibits that will be part of uh, what we present to the community in um, at the end of this month. Uh, we're here at the rail committee. We've done the review of the alternatives matrix and uh, we'll be doing an overview of the cap. And again, we're reviewing the, uh, the work plan. Uh, at the community meeting, we have two more community me meetings planned, the one in November, which will concentrate on the uh, Charleston Meadow Alternatives, uh, we will be bringing forward uh, so <laughs> fire drill? Is this a fire drill? Okay. Adjourning the meeting. Walk to the nearest stairway. Do not use the elevator. Walk to the nearest stairway. So we'll have the door right here.
All right, everybody, apologies for the false alarm and also ending to the meeting. Uh, we did adjourn the meeting, and so we were, are not able to reconvene it because uh, people did go home because we had adjourned the meeting. And as an issue of public participation, we are not able to continue it. So that's it, folks. Sorry.